go off to Louis, who's going to start this conversation. But I, I want to thank you individuals as well for, for taking time out in your busy schedules to make this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to stand up. Is that okay? Sit back. Sit back. Sit back. Sit back. Come back here. So, um, my name is Luis Guzman, and uh, I was born in Calle, Puerto Rico, raised in New York City. Uh, my family moved to the Lower East Side in 1969. We moved to Mazur Towers over there on the Land Sea and Columbia Street. And uh, at that time, that was middle class housing. Um, I think it still is. Um, and, uh, but I ventured out from there. I ventured out to Avenue C, Avenue, Avenue B. It was ghetto, you know? It was uh, the war zone. That's what I knew. And that's where my biggest influence came from. Uh, people like Bimbo Rivas, Jorge Brando, uh, uh, the New York Weekend Poets Cafe, people like Carmen Lopez, Martita Morales, Carmen Hernandez, uh, so many. Tato. Uh, huh? Tato. Tato La Viera. Yeah, I can't remember all the names because I'm 400 years old. So I'm not <laughs> but anyway, in all honesty, I mean, just being surrounded by, by all these community activists, all these artists, I mean, we're talking about musicians, we're talking about poets, we're talking about writers, we're talking about Bomba Plenero dancers, congueros, you name it. Um, those were my influences, and, and uh, at the time, we needed it. We needed it because, you know, we were always looking for the soul of our neighborhood, of our community. But for me, that's, that's how it came to me. Um, and, and like I said, just hanging out with all these guys and all the poetry readings that we went to, you know, all the bambas, all the block parties. That was, that was like a real neighborhood thing, which unfortunately here in 2021, it's been very much uh, minimized by this gentrification and overdevelopment of our community. So, um, but anyway, uh, it was important to me because, again, it, it gave me a foundation. It gave me a foundation and it gave me a sense of belonging. Like, you know, these are my people, you know. We belong together, we grow together, uh, we stimulate each other. And it was along those lines that I met people like Lee, you know. Um, uh, Lee, so you guys know, is like one of my biggest influences as far as the arts go, because um, I, was, I was working at Henry Street Settlement, and in junior high school 56, the Hamburg Court, he painted one of the most incredible murals I've ever seen in my life. Oh, yeah. You know? So, um, but anyway, that, that's who I am and, and where I am, but um, I'd like to ask you guys, first of all, to introduce yourself, um, where you're from in the neighborhood, and what were some of your influences? So, Davis Press. <laughs> and by the way, this is our first time doing it, so let's give a, a round of applause. I already told her, she told me if she starts to cry, we're all going to cry with her. <laughs> In this community. Dale, <laughs> mija. Hi everyone, my name is Sandra Santana. Um, I've lived in the Lower East Side my whole life. Um, I live in Baruch. Um, I was raised with my grandmother and I raised my two daughters also in the same apartment. Um, we moved into Baruch in 1973. Before then, my parents, um, my grandma lived on Fifth Street and C. But I don't remember that. I just know we live there. Um, the only home I've ever known is where I live now. Um, I'm gonna. S I can't really. S I don't know who I was influenced by. I'm sorry, um, but I do remember that um, in the eighth grade, my 
music teacher just saw something in me and uh, I feel like it has always been suppressed and I feel like um, the universe is telling me that the time is right now, so that's why I'm here. Um, my name is Lee Quinones and uh, I'm a recovering graffiti artist. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that. But, um, yeah, I was uh, born in Puerto Rico, in Ponce. Uh, and I was brought here eight months old to the lower, lower east side, which is right by the Brooklyn Bridge, the, the last standing projects. And uh, uh, all my life I've been drawing and painting since I was five years old. And uh, uh, in a quick sense, uh, I got my, uh, I ground my teeth on the New York City subway system in the early 70s in the, in the graffiti movement uh, explosion that happened and now worldwide. Um, and but I, I hung out a lot. I loitered a lot in the avenue as we knew it, and it was really exciting there and very dangerous. But it was what I would say the extension of the lower lower. It was it was we lived in the shadows of the lower east side, but we felt that we were all together. And uh, a lot of my influences, believe it or not, were um, uh, music scores from films. I loved Isaac Hayes and Lalo Schifrin and uh, John Williams and all those cats that they just made me feel alive and they made me feel like whatever I was doing, whether it was poetry or painting, I felt very powerful with the music as my backwind. So there in short, without boring you, that's, you know, and still continuing to paint to this day. Um, and uh, just excited to be here with all our friends and within this beautiful show of Al Diaz and uh, with, with legends of yours. So. Uh, Jose Generoso Flores Araya is my name given at, at birth, but here you have to draw the middle name and then you are known as Pepe Flores. Uh, this year, 2021, it's my 50th anniversary of moving to New York City. Right. It's been that long that I uh, moved into this neighborhood. And um, I'm really lucky that I moved into the Lower East Side, or Lower East Side, uh, because I came to be like, if I was in Pueblo de Puerto Rico, and I got my tissue because we're gonna cry today, a lot, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid, of, you know. Uh, of crying because of this memory. Just seeing this guy, which I met when he was 15 years old at a speed on 14th Street, I didn't even remember, I remember that. <laughs> but, but it's great because he's not a man at the poet's respect. No, I, I, I know him before that. I met him before that. So I, I moved into this neighborhood which happened to be a blessing in disguise to me because, like I'm telling you, I mean, back in the old days, you walk out of your house and before you get to the corner, you say hello to at least 10 people, mm -hmm. if not more. Today, it takes me 10 blocks to say hello to a person that I see. Not counting Adela, because you know, that's family. So yeah, that doesn't count. But uh, yeah, I saw the best and the worst of this neighborhood. You know, I saw the creative side of it. I saw the, the, the beautiful people of it. I saw the drug cart scene that really fucked us up. Very bad. We lost a lot of people, young and old. And, uh, and actually, you know, it was Crack, the one that really put the nail in the coffin to this neighborhood. You know, that's when developers, over overdeveloping, really took off. So um, it's it's an honor to be here. I'm glad that Al invited me for this. Uh, I, somebody called me today, yesterday, to a, a special rumba out of the neighborhood, and I was like. Baby, come back, baby. No, no, no. I gave my word to uh, to be there tomorrow, and, I, and that's what I'm here. I have to be here. We have to be here to let the world know and the people know that the Loisaida community was a very significant, vibrant community, very creative, and, uh, and that's it. That's great. Listen to you. I, I mean, I can, I can relate to everything that everyone here has said. I'm, my name is Al Diaz. I'm a, a certified um, 
product of the Lower East Side. I was born and raised here. I lived here until um, well into my 30s. Um, I haven't had a Lower East Side address for about 15 years. I've been re relocated to Brooklyn, but I still have a lot of dealings here. Um, I think I was influenced by, I, first of all, I, saw, I, I became aware of my need to create at a very young age. And I, I was blessed with, uh, even though I went to a, the local Catholic school, that was the closest thing to any kind of private school that one might experience here. I, I had the, the uh, I was blessed by having an art teacher like Henry Fiol, who's you know, a vital uh, contributor to, to Latin music and to painting. And he inspired me and people like, you know, that there was, there would, there would be like, uh, drawing and painting classes held in, I don't know, in East Harlem, and, and my parents were, 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 were kind enough to, I, my, I remember my father used to drive me up to 125th Street to, to, to the same building where WWRL was, remember WWRL, yeah. and Dick Gregory, and they had drawing classes for kids there, or painting classes, and, and I did that, and, and before um, University of the Streets was, University of the Streets, there was a, a furniture store and they had drawing classes on the second floor there. So as a kid, I, even though we, you know, I came from the projects as well, I was blessed to have, you know, to have to be able to, to explore um, my creative um, side or whatever. And uh, that, that set me up for, for, a, a, for a life of, of wanting to be and pursuing a, a career as an artist. Like, what was the first thing, your first piece, you know, that you did um, that not only influenced you, but influenced other people here in the neighborhood that you can remember? Wow. Um, well, as far as, um, you had mentioned earlier the Hamble Court uh, mural that I had painted in the schoolyard of Junior High School 56, which was, the uh, junior high school that I never finished. Um, <laughs> and because uh, I was just painting every night. And I did a big mega mural, the first of its kind, uh, called Howard the Duck, based on the Howard the Duck character from the DC comics. Um, and uh, it was the first of its kind, and it was a time of an arri arrival for me as an artist, because I knew that I was doing something very unprecedented. and. Uh, Behind me, again, mentioning the music that was behind me was the influence of DJs in the neighborhood. You know, like DJs Apache from the Balladics, yeah. and Ice and Spanky from uh, the Smith Projects. Uh, so that music was always in my veins, and so was the, the paint and the fumes. I'm surprised I'm not glowing in the dark yet, but um, yeah, that mural pretty much changed the pace and the, um, the taste of graffiti as we knew it. And it was, to me, it was just another challenge, a personal challenge. But um, at the same time, I knew I was creating something that was gonna push the envelope further and just change, flip the script. So um, I already had exhausted everything I could do on the subways, 120 plus whole cars, entire whole cars. And I just felt I needed to do something that would be different and not running away from you. So that, that's what I can remember. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, music is, is one of my passions. I'm a dancer, but I think I came out dancing. I didn't come out walking. I came out dancing out of my, my mother's belly. And uh, unfortunately, I, I was raised in a very, very poor conditions in Puerto Rico, you know, in the, in the countryside. And when I was about five or six years old, I used to put the radio station of the, of the, of the government W.W. Perry was a radio station and they used to play classical music. And I used to take these things and go like this. And they say, he's crazy, you know? And I was telling them, I want to take violin classes. But they, I mean, they couldn't have, I mean, they, 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 they didn't know, no idea, they couldn't afford it. So, how, 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 I ended up, ended up being a dancer. And uh, basically, salsa music, that's what I, I especially, I dance, but also born by plena. So, out of those uh, uh, interests, I met uh, this woman that was part of an organization. Her name is uh, Roberta Flack. No, Roberta Singer. Roberta Flack is a singer. 
Roberta Singer, and she was able to get some money from, uh, from Nia, a lot of people. So we developed a program in Tompkins Square Park. These are the days of the, of the bank show. It's, it was called Dos Alas, Two Wings. And we used to have music from Puerto Rico and music from Cuba, because there's a famous poem by Martí, Cuba y Puerto Rico son compadros las dos alas, reciben balas y tiros en el mismo corazón. So we, we had that for, we, we have been around for about four or five years. Uh, we had a lot of people coming in there. Uh, people were very uh, excited in the summertime having a music in there. And, and that was a tradition because Tompkins Square Park always was a magnet for music. I mean, to talk back in the 60s, the, the rock and roll, uh, then the punk scene that was here, and then we had to put out, you know, you know like, like I, that's what I, I, I sold it to Roberta. So that we're here, we have a traditional music, and we only, and we really play, we really, we were presenting salsa music per se, we were playing Hidalgo music and Bombay Clan music. Oh, salsa, for a minute. That's in the air, you know what I mean? Everybody can hear that. This music is not, doesn't have the, the, the exposure that needs to be, that needs, needs, needs uh, here. So it happened. And then uh, the other thing that I did with music was related to my other interest, which is education. I was a daycare teacher for 30 years in a daycare on First Avenue and 9th Street called Children's Liberation. So can you imagine the name? When we put the name to the daycare, people say, what is that, Children's Liberation? Yeah, that's what it is, Children's Liberation. These kids were coming down the street with guns and rifles. I have the revolution. No, no, no. This is because more than that, and uh, that's how, how I, uh, I think that I uh, sort of impacted the neighborhood. Besides the Boys Cafe, which I uh, collaborated a lot with Willie Correa, and in other ways. I was, at, I was at that show. I, I went to see Conjunto Libre at Campos Plaza. Oh, okay. Thank I actually I met Manny Akendo. He showed oh. me his team mother. Very cool. Wow. Very, very cool. I have to say, Henry Fiol, one of his teachers, is an icon and, and, and a legend in Latin music, not only as a singer, but as a painter. He's a, yeah, he was my art and music teacher in St. Bridges, which was across the street from Tompkins Square Park. And so I sat across the street from Tompkins Square Park for eight years of my life and watched uh, just about everything happen there. Like naked hippie people walking in. It was it was a it was a culturally enriching life. I I mean I gotta say I was you know there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, but I grew up on that block, Seventh Street. That's where I'm from. I lived on that block for many years as an adult. I I was part. I got sucked into the whole you know drug uh, infestation thing. I was part of that problem, um, which which I overcame. And uh, but what. My first earliest accomplishment, which is probably the most iconic that I that I have, you know, I mean, I, I, I could tell stories about, was my my uh, friendship and, and graffiti campaign with Jean Michel Basquiat. We did the same on graffiti in 1978, which got you know some local fame, and, and then later became a, a, a influential graffiti, but not graffiti. It was a different kind of graffiti kind of thing that we did, and 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 uh, it was. Beneficial to both our careers, I guess. Um, but that's the most well-known thing. Although I think you know, my life has been filled with you know wonderful accomplishments and wonderful blessings from from just from life, you know, as well as curses and the rest of that. There's ups and downs. But uh, the Lower East Side is once again has been you know my base of op or was at this, it no longer really is, but it was my base of operations and. And I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, involved with the 1980s uh, music scene here, you know, the, the alternative music. And um, what else? And, and the art movement, which, which has, you know, which, how arts is, is all about conserving that, that uh, generation, and that uh, movement, if you will. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much. And you better remember Wigstock? Wigstock, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I can't tell any of these stories growing up. I just watched um, my mom working really hard and my grandmother trying to take care of all of us. And um, I wasn't exposed to a lot of things 
art-wise. Um, the, the goal was to just get me a good job, get me married, and have a stable life. Um, I think now, as an adult, many things um, are being exposed to me, and I actually get to uh, use my words and uh, impact um, people. <clears throat> Take your time. Okay, everybody cry. We with you, we with you. See what I told you? <laughs> no, it just it just feels like my life is just changing and I have no control over what's going to happen, but um, I'm in it to win it, so. <laughs> if I can add to that, okay? Any artist, whether they're a poet, uh, a painter, a sculptor, an actor, um, a creator, always puts themselves in a very vulnerable place because you're there, spotlights on you, the whole world looks at you, even if your world is only consisting of five people in your circle. You're always putting yourself in a situation where you have to um, have thick skin for being critiqued, um, for being questioned about what are your motives and what drives you and what keeps you going. And sometimes you have to ask yourself that question too. But sometimes I sit in my studio in Brooklyn and I look at four walls and I realized at one point I said this before, I actually have three walls. The three walls are the walls that I actually paint on. But the fourth wall is the world, the world outside of my studio. So I have to feel good with my work, even if I hate it sometimes. I have to feel good that I have to let it go so that everyone else can experience it. And just because you see something in blue doesn't, see, doesn't mean everyone else will see it in blue. They'll see it in different colors. So your work is always open for interpretation. And that's the beauty about it, that you just never know what it can turn into and what, can it, what it can open. I mean, I was painting before I was, and we sort of became co-conspirators in the same movement that's become uh, such a, and the same with music, right? And so all these influences are, are that third, that fourth wall. So it, it's great to be in that spot of uh, being uncomfortable and sometimes being vulnerable. It's fine, because we all are at the end of the day. And that's, that's the... Uh, no, I want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Okay. So, um, so you guys have seen the changes that have gone on in our neighborhood. You know, um, I know for me personally, it's like highs and lows of stuff. Because, you know, when the Lower East Side was burning down, we were trying to save buildings. We, we did the whole sweat equity thing. Adopt a building. Adopt a building. Um, just trying to get our old people um, trained into how to reconstruct your tenement building, how to do plumbing, how to do your own electrical and stuff like that. And manage. And manage. Once you do that, manage. Yeah. So. Sorry. And it was it was it was a real struggle. It was a real struggle. It was a real learning curve for us. And so, I like to ask you guys. You know, considering all the stuff that we've been through where we come from and the changes that have been taking place over the years. How have that affected you and what you do and your art and your influences out there? That's a loaded question. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it, it, I, I talk about that every, every day, really, in my art. And I, I, you know, I react to it, I respond, I try to educate people with with that message because what happened you know it's funny because when we, we grew up I was looking at some somebody posted a picture of a, of a, a lot and it's got my tag on it and it's you know it's like from 1974 or something 
And it's, it's the blown out, burnt out, Hiroshima looking Lower East Side that we grew up in, that I lived in every day. And what occurred to me, well, I, it wasn't even, even about like looking at my graffiti. It, what, what I was looking at was like, damn, we got used to this stuff. We were like being like conditioned to be accepting living in squalor, in this mess. And like that's normal. And, and, and it's that. what's totally unacceptable to us. Became, we were being conditioned to accept the unacceptable. So what happens is, you, uh, first of all, my generation, we grew up expecting less, right? So because it's okay. But what happens is in comes development skips over our people who, are, who actually struggle and, and contributed to the culture there, etc., etc. We're educated, they have, have families, raised children, steamrolls over that and brings in a whole new, or, or builds for a whole other class. So we're excluded completely, even though you were basically the pioneers. Imagine all of those people that rode to the Wild West. And, just go, and, and that and that's probably the most painful thing that, to witness. Because, you know, I mean, I walked down, I, I lived across from, me and my ex-wife lived across from Katz's Deli. My uncle was a counterman at, you know, selling hot dogs there for, for, for many years. So I knew, that was my name, that's like, like Pepe was, was talking, it was our neighborhood. We knew people by name, you walk out the street and everybody, it takes you 20 minutes to get to the corner because you're saying hello to everybody. But what happens is, it, you go out there now and it looks like Midtown. So there's this, 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 there's this hole in your soul. It's like if you grew up there, because it's like, what is this place? Even though you do see remnants of, of your history, it's just like so splintered. And then it's like, they, they put these, you know, mega structures right, right in the middle. No finesse, no, no, no regard for history, etc., etc. So it's actually, for me, it's a very passionate thing, and I talk about the stuff, you know, because it was kind of like we got ripped off, you know, as usual. You know, somebody else was just talking about something, which was it's not for the poor people, and it's it, that's you know, how, oh, David Gonzalez, New York Times, uh, made a, a funny comment. He said. Any place that's in fluxes, where they're like trying to like you know develop, like it's the the uh, generic name is no mo po. <laughs> so, like I said before, I grew up in the Lower East Side my my entire life, um, and just seeing all the changes in the last twenty years or whatever. It really breaks my heart because I feel like, just like what you said, the all the new things that are being done does not include us. It does not include my children. It includes everybody else. So in my own neighborhood where I once felt like this was my home, I kind of feel like a stranger. I kind of feel like an outsider. and. It's, it's kind of sad, even, um, I mean, you know, growing up, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy growing up in the Lower East Side. There were a lot of stuff going, going happening around in the neighborhoods. But, and now it feels like, you know, in, in my building, because I lived there so long, I still have people that moved in before, so I love them. I love to be able to go to certain neighbors, people that seen me grow up. Um, that still call me by my nickname. Like I love that seeing my kids grow up and giving them really like, like they're loved. Everybody wants to build a bit of, a bigger building. Everybody wants to get rid of us so that they can make room for other people. And nobody cares about those kids. And I wish that something or someone could reach out to them and show them that. There's so much more that they are missing out of, and nobody's going to give it to them. And it's, 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 it's really a shame. And that saddens me. I don't see, like, a future of community and, 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 and hope, because there's a lot of desperate people, because the people that have want to keep and want to have more and don't want to don't want to make a way for anybody else. 
and I think it's unfair. say that um, there's always a ratio of, that, of, of, of young people, young souls, uh, that some make it and many don't. It's always, I, I guess it's always been like that for many years. I, I, I wanted to express something about the Lower East Side in particular. It has to do with water and bridges. I grew up in the projects on the 15th floor with 360 degree view five major bridges in New York City. The Verrazano, the Brooklyn, the Manhattan, the Williamsburg, and the 59th Street Bridge. In the projects. Imagine that. But the one thing that really saved me as an artist, as a young child, is that I was always able to see the moving waters, the river flowing, and the bridges that brought you somewhere else, outside of the Lower East Side. And to me, those bridges were not too far. It wasn't a bridge too far. It was a bridge that brought me farther. And as a child, I grew up watching my projects deteriorate right before my eyes. I remember the first blackout in 1965. Not the 77 one, the one in 1965. And from that year on, as the Vietnam War was raging, and as uh, inequality issues were really rearing their heads and uh, racism as we see it today the same back then i saw my projects go from really middle class establishment go down the tubes all nationalities went through the gauntlet of terror and fear and you might remember this um that they, that Right in front of the Brooklyn Bridge, underneath the highway, on Sundays, there used to be a huge music festival. I don't know if you do. It's more toward 10th Street. It is street punk. No, that one was also one on 10th Street in the park, in the uh, Jackson Park, as we used to call it. But I know which one you're talking about. But, but the one on South Street, right by Catherine Street, underneath uh, the FDR okay. Drive, it was a huge festival that happened every Sunday. My father was running that whole show. He ran a whole operation. A lot of it on the world, kind of, you know, lots of things moving around. But it was one of the most festive. Nice. Everything. Everything. I mean, and some of the best dancing, the best food, everything was happening under that highway till 2 in the morning. And as a child, I would go down there so I could see it right in front of it was right in front of my windows. I could look down and see at least 2,000 people dancing and just toasting it up all night long. And it was it was very inspirational. It was all salsa. It was all and people came from the avenue, mm -hmm. from all sorts, from Spanish Harlem. It was a huge operation. My father had it on lockdown. <laughs> and I mean, he shook everybody down for like, you want to operate here? You know, it was one of those deals where he was a musician as well. And very inspirational because he was, um, I looked up to him, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, um, I'm a product of his love affair with my mother. He's my biological father. <laughs> I'm dirty dog. Susan, Susan. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, it was that beauty that, you know, like water, it always finds the cracks. It finds its way down hill to a better place. And I think young people will eventually always find something, whether it's a movement, you know, or whatever, where, whichever shape and form it finds it finds the children the children find it and something comes from it and that's the beauty about new york it reinvents itself all the time yes it does, it does. it's just like a big it's a big construction site all the time and people eventually find movements whether it's in music or in poetry or in mute in, in painting um so at least and i'm i'm one of those finger pointers i'm like you're always on your you're always on your screen, you're always, you know, and nobody talks to each other anymore, but I, I still have faith that the young will always find a way to 
create their voice. Yeah, I, I'm not a turn out optimist. I have to be honest with you. I know things are rough, especially the last year and a half has been hell. But before I do my take on that, I want to tell you a little anecdote between seeing the ninety dollars, seventy-five dollars for three for two bedrooms, <laughs> a living room and kitchen, <laughs> and uh, and it was a lot of money, man. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I had about three jobs. <laughs> so, so I go in there, and one morning, I hear a rooster. But not a regular rooster, this is like a real macho, you know, a real heavy guy. You, know, like you could tell this guy was in, in, in steroids or something. But you, I didn't see it. Six o'clock in the morning, kick it, no kick it. I mean, his kicking the key was more like, what I'm doing is a limitation. So that went for three or four days. So one morning, I'm walking out of my apartment, and I saw this guy, and I said, hey, my name is Pepe Flores, I just moved in here. Oh, Paco, okay, chévere, Paco. And Paco, mira, every morning I hear a, a rooster singing in here, man, and I'm going like crazy, I just came from Puerto Rico, you know, like, maybe I'm there dreaming, you know, I'm still, I think that I'm in Puerto Rico, but I'm here. And he said, hello, come here. He opens the door of his house, and those apartments, you, when you walk in, you walk into the kitchen. And, uh, and then he, he opened the bathroom door. He had a rooster over there. <laughs> Pero no un gallo pendejo, era un gallo de pelea. He was a cock fight, fighting motherfucker. <laughs> and that guy, he looked better than me. I mean, that guy was, you know, I wouldn't try to have a fight with this rooster. And the, 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 the metaphor of that is that, you know, we Puerto Ricans, we, when we brought, when we came here in our suitcases, our culture, our, our language, our customs, nuestra costumbre, nuestra fiesta, nuestra celebraciones, venían con nosotros. And because of people like Paco, I've been able to have this positive attitude in life. I'm not going to say that. There's nothing wrong, you know, the things that are, are wrong, very wrong. But, but we have to try to keep a positive side of things in life. And like what he said, to have faith in those youngsters. But then, of course, with our help, okay? Because they need, as, as adults, with experience, they need, they need us. And you, your family, you need your daughters, your nephews, your brothers, whatever. They're going to need you. You're going to draw the rock for them to survive this madness. So the, the thing about the rooster is that if you, if you look at the, at the movie that Panya World Stars made called Our Latin Thing, there is a cop fight. And you know where they pin that cop fight? On Fifth Street between C and D. <laughs> there was a, an illegal oh. cop fight ring. And, and, and uh, I don't know if you know that that movie was filmed, most of it was here. And that movie that's, that uh, it, it propelled salsa music into the world, okay, totally into the world, and most of it was filmed down here. So I'm going to be 70 years old in, in, in August, and uh, I, I I got I have to stay positive. And one of the reasons that helping me to hold to that faith. It's an organization on 9th Street, and you should write this down. It's called Loisaida uh, Center, between C and D, 710. And there's a young blood over there working in there. Tato Laviera was one of the founders of that organization. Tato Laviera was one of the founders of the festival, of the, of the Avenue C Festival that was supposed to be celebrated today, and we, uh, because of the weather and because of the pandemic, they, they couldn't do it. But hay una gente joven ahí que están haciendo un trabajo increíble. And I'm collaborating with them next week. Put it in your calendar. Next week, I'm having a celebration for, from Puerto Rico called Fiesta de Cruz. We're going to have an incredible uh, plena group, uh, half men, half women. You know, I always like to give women empowered them. As a matter of fact, the guy that was the, 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 in charge of that, of the music part for me in that celebration, he died on me two months ago because of the COVID. And you know what? There was this young woman, 
And I hired her and said, you're going to do it. And she told me, why are you giving me this, this responsibility? Because you're a woman, you're a young woman, Puerto Rican young woman, and you need to be empowered. You cannot be afraid. You can do it. Are you going to be in charge of this? So I, uh, I would like to invite you people to, you know, it's going to be limited. So you got to, my phone number is going to be there somewhere. You got to make a reservation. But this is an incredible, incredible celebration of faith, of music, of culture, of Puerto Rican culture, something that is being forgotten even in Puerto Rico, but we're keeping it here. And not only that, this celebration of Fiesta de Cruz is legendary in the Lower East Side from all the way back from the 50s. Okay, there was uh, people, especially women, are the one that carry this tradition. And it's a very special thing. And you don't have to believe in the, in the cross or whatever. It's just the, 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 the element of unity and the element of, of faith that people come in there and, and, and say hello to each other and we eat. And, we eat. and I'm going to make a sopong for that day. Amen. But if you don't sing, you don't get to eat. <laughs> okay? So you have to go to say Thank you. So, um, we have, we have, uh, uh, so we have enough time for a few questions from our audience. Yes. Sandra, can you read some poems for us? Yes. Yes. Why not? Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Question. Bob Holman. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say that I'm very grateful for the fact that we can see this. Because these are all very, very inspirational. To me, as a young kid from New York City, I'm looking at every person that I saw every day of my life growing up. And I'm just going to tell you that it's so, so tremendous to me to see you all still doing what you're doing and still inspiring more and more and more people. I got to say, God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do draw a connection um, being Boricua myself and being that we come from a people where just being born, you're automatically coming out the womb fighting, right? And f fighting and art has always been a very parallel thing of uh, being Boricua, right? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask, um, because in the 70s and the 80s, because of the, the, the pandemic that we had then, right? Crack and all that, and heroin that infiltrated our neighborhoods. Um, you see the reemergence of a lot of art, right? Because you know, when, when people are down, what well, we know how to do good, we know how to party, we know how to do arts. We know how to be, we know how to cultivate the culture, and this is why we're part of it, right? To be in city. So my question is like, being now that we're in a time where it, it, we were, we're uh, again, um, economically, uh, disinvestment is happening in our communities, um, things are being taken away from us, um, I, I feel and I hope and I know that there's going to be an emerging culture, this good part that's going to be made now. And I, I, I wonder if there's a, a connection between a, a, um, being in the lower side, I mean, I'm in the lower side and, um, and being Puerto Rican, um, uh, dealing with the struggle and how does that transform into today, like uh, making art, like I messed up all that question, but I just want to draw a connection between art and the the resistance and today that what we're going through. Yeah, that I mean, single word like you said is activism. Activism through your art. Um, great art always comes out of confrontation, out of difficult places. That's what makes the most incredible, vivid, genuine art. And then. The art around that makes art about that, you know, so it's always the nucleus that is the most yeah. purest. And uh, like I said before, I think there'll be a lot of culminations, you know, a lot of connections, junction boxes, if you want to call it, um, where people will find each other. They will ultimately find each other and find a little tidbit of a voice that explodes into something bigger. And it doesn't always have to happen in New York. It can happen in other cities. There's struggles all across the, the nations and the world, but, um, you know, I really believe that. I, I mean, not, not, yeah. Not, not, not to cut you off, but this is living proof right here, because, mm -hmm. you know, we all in different places, you know, mm -hmm. but we came together for this. Yeah. We came together for the neighborhood. 
We came together because this is our roots. You know, this is where part of our soul, you know, was created and born and yeah. nourished and nurtured. So keep going. Keep we, going. We, will, we will always, <laughs> we, we, we will you always are, find each other. You are part of this. You are so, part of this. So we're going to end this with a poem. I never imagined. I never imagined God being a woman. In my mind, I think of my mother and all that she did. Mi madre, she has superpowers. She knew when you were up to no good and cried tears when you hurt. Her prayers went directly to heaven. She was relentless. I never imagined God being a woman till I had my own daughters and I knew in an instant I would die so that they may live. Sometimes find courage when there was none to give and love endlessly. I never conceptualized God being a woman until I watched my mother make something from nothing. Algo de nada. Nunca la mesa vacía. Clothes on our backs. I never imagined God being a woman until I bathed my own children and it was a ritual of cleansing and rebirth. How I can distinguish each cry from another and find them in the dark. My mother, mi madre, mi diosa. How she laid the foundation so that we had a path, a path to follow. How she suffered silently and held us all. I never thought God as a woman till I had to forgive those who hurt me so that I can truly love. I never perceived God being a woman until I saw my mother hold the sins of her sons, merciful and life-giving, encumbered with all the daily burden, and still have the strength to carry yours. Yeah. Yeah. This was a good time. Wow. Yo. That's beautiful. <laughs>